Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here for another CISO Talk. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Pete Nicoletti. Pete, it's great to see you, my friend. Grant, always great working with you. I follow all your podcasts and uh, being one of them is uh, is an honor. So, uh, ah, Well, it, it, ditto right back at you, man. Um, it's always fun talking with you. I think uh, today's subject's gonna be a good one. You know, um, all the rave is, is zero trust, right? I mean, we hear so much about zero trust, least privilege, ZTNA. I, I mean, it's very, very popular. We know it's not a product, but we also know, I, I mean, it seems like, Pete, sometimes it's a little misleading. Some people get lured into thinking, hey, wow, if if I go full on and implement zero trust, I'll never get breached or hacked or have any vulnerabilities again. And that's not the case. No. But maybe let's first frame up kind of the core I know there's some real core pillars in zero trust that organizations need to have. So maybe you can take a second and first just frame up zero trust and what these core components are. So absolutely, and, and let's emphasize it's not a product. It's absolutely a journey. It's a combination of product. It's a combination of, you know, implementing, you know, it's a security principle as, as we've talked about before. Yep. Um, and the principle requires multiple controls, multiple products, and it, and it's and it's a journey, and it's and it's not easy. You know, we're seeing, uh, you know, we'll get to some statistics here in a little bit, but we're seeing that it is a challenging topic because, you know, some business executive will hear some talk about zero trust, and they'll come to the CISO saying, "Hey, I want zero trust, and right. uh, I don't want them accessing, you know, my." customer data and the CISO goes, well, we're on our journey. So right. let's talk about that. You know, everything used to be perimeter based. It was either inside or outside. And if you're inside the perimeter, you had full range. And we saw huge problems with that. We saw that once the perimeter was breached, you know, malicious uh, actors would be able to gain access to everything. So <laughs> one of the principles and the thoughts behind zero trust is to just give those uh, the people that are accessing the network on an authorized basis, just give them the the applications and the and and the access that that is appropriate for their job functions. Sure. So one of the things I like to say is appropriate trust rather than zero trust. What's appropriate for you to do your job? If you're if you're just you know answering phones and and entering in one application. You know, that should be your appropriate level of trust. If you're a developer, you should have a completely different set of of trust. If you're, you know, an executive that, that has to look at employee data and HR data, you know, that should be some trust that, that, that you have. If you're, you know, if you're the scientist behind the proprietary recipes of, of your ketchup company, you know, that's uh, that's the trust that you should have, and you should be able to modify the recipe or gain access to that. So it's really a change from just this perimeter inside outside to an appropriate level of trust. But I I think you'll agree, the principle is the starting point is zero. Oh, in absolutely. All, in, in, yeah, yeah, in all course. instances, in in every absolutely. instance. Now yep. there. There, there are some key reasons, really five, right, um, that security leaders really should get into zero trust. You want to kind of run through those and uh, the critical components it provides? Sure, absolutely. So zero trust is important for a couple things. Number one is visibility. You know, back when it was just an either or, either you're in or out, you know, the visibility was okay, they're in. But now visibility, now what zero trust or appropriate trust gives you is they understand what device you're using, what data you're uh, accessing, which applications you're, you're approved to use, what services. So having that visibility based on what you're allowed to do, it, it, it really enhances the security. Plus it also cuts down on license costs. You know, back in the old perimeter days, 
when when a, a company would come in to sell you a license, they'd say, well, how many users do you have? Well, now with Zero Trust, you can say, well, I've got 2,000 users, but there's only going to be 50 people accessing this particular application. So yeah. that's another way, you know, not just visibility, but cost savings. And then the next it's thing almost, is... It's almost... Isn't, yeah. Pete, um, the visibility component is is... It's almost like you can't get there without first having an accurate inventory of everything oh, yeah. because the whole principle is to have zero trust for in, any digital access right yep. so 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 the visibility component it, i think is huge because it's a forced full inventory yep uh, you know uh, that's different than you know giving me you know, a span port visibility on the network traffic, right? I mean, it's a, well, it's, you've got it's a great, you've got a great point because think of what's happened with, uh, you know, cloud deployments and with work at home, you've got work at home people that in the old way of doing things could use their kid's computer that's downloaded every, you know, malware from Timbuktu to, to Moscow. Yep. Uh, now with that inventory, you know that your level of trust is going to be different if it's a corporate provided and manage device that has the latest antivirus tools. It's got the latest, uh, yep. you know, endpoint tools. It's got anti phishing and anti malware on the email. With the uh, with the variety of, of 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 devices, once again, that inventory is a key thing. So, you really nailed a, a good one there. That that's one of the basic tenets of zero trust is having that inventory, and then changing your level of trust based on what you're using. Uh, right in that inventory so and then that, that kind of jumps right into the next thing is the end user experience you know uh you know we know everybody hates managing multiple passwords and you know one of the one of the the tenants of zero trust is that once you're you know once we know who you are and and you the the inventory of the device that you're using all the uh, behind the scenes authentication, your SSO, your single sign on is going to be authenticated and ready to go. So no longer do you have to go through the tedious 15 minute process of, oh, crap, I need that application. Well, I need this application. Mm -hmm. I need to log in here. Oh, what's the password? Oh, that expired and it's not tied to Active Directory. It used to be such an incredible pain to get to the 10 applications I needed to, to get to work. And some people have more than that. Um, and now with that end user experience has improved so much more, uh, so better. You're, you're, it's a faster login. You're getting access to the things that you're appropriate to, to, to view and use. And you're being, and, and all this situation is being monitored as well. So that if you do something malicious or you do something outside of your, area it's going to flag so that yeah well, the threat modeling uh monitoring uh, ability goes way up because you know what's allowed and what's not allowed and it's really uh a, a change of pace too yeah that experience i think is becoming more and more and more significant i think we've seen huge strides uh with secure service edge uh, uh, and that implementation, uh, because we're all, I mean, who's using MPLS or, uh, you know, kind of lease lines anymore, right? I mean, those days are so far gone. Um, but to your point, you know, when I'm at grandma's house and I'm using her device, uh, I have to have uh, a great user experience with access to the resources I need. But the trust level obviously has to be implemented differently based on that device, right? And that's Absolutely. part of the implementation. And well, you, bring up, other... you bring up one more point that is key. Yeah. You know, say a company moves their application from an in-house uh, hosted to a cloud. Before, you used to have to announce that to the to the consumers, hey, we're changing here. You've got to log into this different VPN. You have to log in this different way. This is... Zero Trust enables flexibility and speed and a much faster uh, way to support uh, new applications coming online because all of that is invisible to the end user, which is right. a huge benefit. So 
you know, Grant, when you talk about supporting the business and, you know, technology changing, yep. if you have your zero trust uh, model implemented correctly, you're going to be able to support the business and propel the business and keep them competitive right. with this strategy. So, But, you know, the Pete, here's the problem, though, and this is into kind of the next phase of, of the conversation I'd like to have, and that is, you know, a fraction of the enterprises out there have any kind of zero trust implemented. In fact, I think Gartner says only 1% of companies have mature zero trust and estimates that by 2026, only 10% of large enterprises will have a mature zero trust program. So I know 10% seems relatively small. Change from 1 to 10 is significant. But why? What is making this transformation so challenging and difficult? Well, there's a number of them. And, you know, one other stat that's kind of interesting or one other directive is our federal government uh, is mandated to deploy zero trust uh, to access all their networks. And, and of course, we know that uh, we've had multiple uh, break-ins from, you know, the the, uh, the personnel files that were stolen by the Chinese. And, yep. and uh, recently, even the FBI InfraGuard uh, was impacted. And if they had zero trust, that, that uh, authentication issue wouldn't have occurred. And we've we've seen U.S. Marshals uh, affected by it, too. So we know that they're on a journey, uh, and a lot of companies are on a journey. But there's there is some issues. So let's let's tackle a couple of them. You know, the the biggest whopper is what we refer to as technical debt, or you know, some people say security by obsolescence. So yep. you know, hmm. for the companies out there that are still using mainframe, <laughs> there's not many hackers out there learning assembly and and uh, Fortran. And, Wow, and Fortran. So <laughs> yeah, you know, it's why the Fortran programmers that are doing the work for the federal government are so highly paid because right you know it, it's bank. who knew who knew who, that's right. But you <laughs> so, know, to your point, um, it, it it's an area that's gonna gonna change, and and yeah. part of that uh, I think that will help is the fact that they're saying you got to implement that zero trust approach. Um, maybe they'll start off on the right cadence uh, when they replace some of those legacy systems. But technical debt, and we see this definitely more in more advanced countries, right? Because, for example, the United States has a ton of technical debt where you go to other uh, countries that may not be quite so advanced technologically, India, and they don't have all that technical debt. So, all for example, <laughs> you have a lot more cloud, right. cloud native implementation, yeah. right? right? So it's interesting the dynamics around the world. But um, in addition to the technical debt that I think everybody's going to have to deal with, what 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 else is is? I mean, COVID in the remote world that had to have been a game changer, right? Well, it did, and remote work really. It accelerated remote access, but it, what it didn't do is accelerate zero trust programs, and which is unfortunate because. But the the, the problem. What do you mean there, by that? You, do you mean because everybody was forced, and so it was forced. a ready fire aim, and right, we didn't really right. think about it strategically? They did just enough. A lot of companies did just enough to give customers or their employees access. They didn't say, yeah. "Well, hold on here for the next month. We're going to be." deploying all, you know, these 10 different tools that we need to support zero trust. That wouldn't, right. have, that wouldn't have worked. So what happened? Well, that's because everybody had a gun to their head, right? They did. We did. You know, we, yeah. We, a, yeah. <laughs> we sure did. So it was a rush to, to support. So now a lot of companies are coming back and they're tuning up their, their fast moving remote access project. And, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, for all of the apps that the the end user needs to have access to, they need to be supported through uh, through a single sign on, and and some of those apps don't have that functionality, right. especially if it's a homegrown app. You know, a lot not not a lot of people built that uh, type of uh, support in. So 
there's there's a lot of a lot of challenges supporting remote workers, hooking them up with their right app applications. Um, and then here's the other thing. It's a very complex project, mm -hmm. uh, especially in large organizations, because, you know, and, and I've done this multiple times where you map the users to to the applications that need, they need. And in a small company, it's a small spreadsheet, right? Small number of users, small number of apps. But in a large company, it could be thousands of applications yeah. with tens of thousands of users. So it's not even a spreadsheet uh, function anyway. So, and then you have partners uh, throwing in uh, another whole monkey wrench into your zero trust environment, making sure that they have access just to the tools that they want. And then there's the whole dynamic basis because things change. So, yep. you know, if you don't launch your, your zero trust project and move it very, very quickly, it, it almost never seems to get ahead. You're always reacting, 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 rather than just saying, oh, new app, oh, that's no problem. We'll sign that up in 10 minutes. Oh, a new user coming on board, that just takes five minutes. So uh, until it's, if it's halfway, it's not all the way, and that's another right. challenge right there. And I think also, I mean, it's a principle that, I mean, it's like a foundation to your house, right? So if I want to replace my foundation and my house isn't square, but I put in a nice, good, tight, square level foundation, I got a whole lot of other things I need to correct a lot of on top of that, right? Yep. Uh, and that I think, uh, and, and then I guess, you know, you could really mix the metaphor and, and say, uh, uh, to support the dynamic nature. And now that house is on a boat, <laughs> you know, that's uh, on a barge that's floating down a river or on a beach that's constantly changing with the tide so that you've constantly got to be adjusting it. But I, I, I totally agree the complexity it's exacerbated in those countries that do have technical debt, right? I would, I would assert that the higher your technical debt, the higher the complexity on achieving this zero trust uh, panacea. <laughs> but Absolutely. it's not a panacea. And this is really what I think we want to uh, make sure we drive home is uh, hackers are figuring out and finding ways, and I think we'll forever find ways to thwart our best defenses. And so... You know, how do hackers effectively uh, beat zero trust? Because we know they, they There's can. There's a few ways, yeah. And, and we've seen companies that have a decent uh, zero trust uh, implementation, but anything designed by humans can be broken by humans, let's just face it. And, you know, if you look at Rockstar Games, you look at some other examples, you know, you're, we're seeing... Uh, a couple of approaches that are very, very tricky to deal with. You know, uh, some of the companies are dealing with authentication, you know, where you're just worn out uh, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're approached with uh, a bunch of authentication things and, you're, and you know you're not, you know, you know you're not supposed to say yes to it, but you're just, you know, you're burned out from listening. You go, okay, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. And it gets what? It's a hacker you know, bypassing a control, you know, so with, uh, you know, hyper-targeted phishing these days, you know, even here at Checkpoint, uh, little known fact, you know, out of 6,000 employees, there were a couple of our employees that clicked on the bad test, you know, emails, you know, as part of the CISO sure. group, we see that, you know, in a regular organization, you know, formerly it hurts, you know, we had 20, 30% of people clicking on the wrong thing during our training. So we know that you can't depend on humans to be your your final, uh, you know, fixture, you know, your final wall there because they're going to make wrong decisions because the hackers are getting that good. And with generative AI creating uh, the best phishing emails out there and and, uh, and without the, the most advanced anti-phishing tools, you're going to get nailed and then of course yeah, I, I think I, yeah. I, I need I think it's important to also mention Pete that still today and and the number 
I've heard varying numbers, never below 92%. It's always higher. And that is uh, the, the number or percent of compromises, breaches that start with an email. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, and, it's right and it's 89, 90%. Yep. It's, it's overwhelmingly still. And I think it's important if you haven't revisited your, your email and collaboration protection in the last year, um, you're in, you're in, you're in for trouble because now with the whole uh, golems going after it, right, with the generative AI, man, um, they're getting really, really uh, effective. So, so it, it, is it all about um, stealing identities and, and masquerading? Is that, I mean, how much is involving uh, social engineering? Are we going to see more of, of those combinations? We are, and we're going to see... It is it is a, a matter of social engineering, but it's also a matter of a simply simple bribery. You know, a lot of companies are using their cell phones as their secondary authentication. Right. You know, and, and if you've signed up for a bank or if you've signed up for, you know, even Xfinity and, and, and you know, you're if, if you have a higher level of security, the first thing and Twitter, you know, if, to get the blue check mark. It's going to send you an authentication to your cell phone. Well, what's happening is, you know, these $15 an hour people working in a kiosk for a cell phone provider, if somebody walks in there with a $1,000 and said, hey, I want you to port this number over, uh, and you talk to the right person that, you know, thinks that a $1,000, you know, is, is going to be... Is worth the risk. Is worth the risk. Uh, they're going to port your number over. And it's happened to the CEO of Twitter. It's happened to multiple people uh, mm. where the credentials was stolen all through a SIM swap and a report. And the same thing goes with companies that don't have really good uh, processes for changing over who who their relationship is with. In other words, you know, Checkpoint Research and I just did a big study on travel scams. And one of the things that these travel companies have, some of the smaller ones, is it's real easy to change the email to to, to for your rewards. Uh, and 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 the end user that had the a million miles in their account would never know in in certain cases. And they're, they're mm -hmm. able to sell those miles at a at a discount and do all kinds of crazy nefarious deals out there just because. It was the company's fault that was behind a, a lower level of, of authentication. So there's it's a very complex problem. It's not there's not one thing or one product that's going to solve it. So yeah, Grant, it's tough and uh, challenging. So you know the the it seems like you know here again, and we've had this is a story we've read before where. Um, this is the panacea, but the reality is it's not the panacea. It's still Swiss cheese. There's holes. Um, so what can companies do uh, really to to best posture themselves um, and and get themselves going with a zero trust architecture? Well, one of the things that I really like to recommend because a lot, Grant. There's so many companies that have that they're an in, they're at an impasse right now. What the hell do I need to do? I keep hearing about it. What do I do about it? Well, one of the things that I recommend before I get into some specifics is talk to your checkpoint reseller or checkpoint, uh, you know, engineering staff. We have what arguably is the best workshop for taking that taking the zero trust journey. In other words, the, the workshop engineers will come in, spend a couple hours with you. They'll look at the tools or look at the user community. They'll look at the applications. They'll look at uh, what you already have in place because the chances are you have a, a lot of pieces of the puzzle. They're just, you know, not, they're not built on the, on the table yet. So, and then they'll walk you through the, the absolute steps that you need to take. So you're not, jumping to the last step and not gaining the benefits that you need to have with that first step or second step or third step. So that'd be the first thing. 
The next thing I'd say is, you know, you really need to start uh, every zero trust journey starts with authentication and strong authentication. So whether it's FIDO2, whether it's YubiKeys, whether it's, uh, you know, some other multi-factor authentication, you know, knowing who your user is with a, with a, with a certainty is your really the first step on your journey. So figuring that out, but don't make a wrong decision, you know, to where six months later, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're on your journey and they go, well, the particular cheap version of MFA that you choose chose is not compatible with your zero trust journey and you're going to have to scrap it and waste time and money and, and redeploy something else. So once again, back to that workshop, they're going to be able to tell you, Hey, what tool is going to last through your journey? You know, and there's lots of other stuff, you know, from, you know, DNS filtering to your browser, uh, being managed by the corporate policy, you know, Grant, you nailed it with uh, email security. And of course, you know, not to plug Checkpoint too much, but right now we have the leading uh, email security tool out there with the Avanon purchase of a year and a half. It's, you know, it's it's unbelievable. We love to put that tool on behind uh, whatever gateway you might have in place to, to catch all the things and prevent those issues. And, and then, you know, look, and then all of a sudden back to that inventory, knowing where your data is and limiting, uh, you know, old copies, you know, we've just seen a couple hacks where it wasn't the new, uh, working data that the hackers found and, and exfiltrated. They found something that was a couple years old. that was not deprecated and not taken offline. So back to that inventory, it's not just devices. It's where your data is, where that, and, and making sure that it's, uh, that's the only thing that's available uh, as appropriate. And once you, once you uh, not using it anymore, it's either encrypted or deleted or, or put out to floppy disk somewhere. Well, the world's definitely shifting uh, rapidly, I would argue, to identity. I mean, that, that's really going to be the essence uh, that we need. And, and identities are critical because the way, reason you have an identity is to have an associated permission or policy or rule, right? I mean, as, uh, otherwise, uh, you wouldn't have an identity. And, and uh, as you know, it's in everything, every device, every workload, every uh, user. And so that's certainly... I think a big starting point. I think the other thing I was going to mention, you know, when you uh, got started, when I got started in this, you know, the choices, there there weren't a lot of cybersecurity products, right? It's, it's so when you look at today's landscape of literally thousands of vendors, um, it's it's completely different. And I always tell the folks I speak with, it would be presumptuous of me to assume I know what your big rocks are, because in this landscape of thousands of vendors, everybody has a different big rock that they need to tackle, right? Uh, uh, I would assert that if you haven't revisited your whole email collaboration security, that's probably one of the best places to start because it represents such a high percentage of of threats but you know it, it's um it's a different landscape so you know how do i start if i'm a company you know uh, I, I let's what do i do to get started with zero trust today well there's a couple of different resources you know i, I want to emphasize that workshop you can also go out to the NIST resources on zero trust and you can see what the government mandate is. Um, you can also look at uh, the Cloud Security Alliance. Cloud Security Alliance, uh, there's several members of Checkpoint that are actually on the, the uh, working group uh, that actually makes recommendations and, and will walk you through that journey. But once again, the, the workshops are, are super effective yeah. Uh, you know, the thing that I really want to see more of is security executives taking a leadership role in this rather than a reactionary role. You know, with if you look at the, the principle of zero trust and all the components of it, you'll also notice that it maps to hundreds of different compliance requirements. 
And, you know, right now we're starting to hear uh, insurance companies talking about what is and finding out and asking the company, hey, what's your zero trust strategy? Right. And if you don't have a strategy, if you don't have answers there, your rates are going to go up or you may not be able to, to, to get cyber insurance. So there's there's other pressures that are going on it. And also the fact that you want to remain competitive. You know, yeah. if, if you have a zero trust strategy in place and you're more mature than, than others, trust me, uh, there's companies out there that are scanning your company and they're yeah. reporting as partners, uh, you know, which one of these companies is, is more effective in their security controls. And, you know, as I was the previous CISO at Hertz, and we started out pretty poorly when I came on board. And at the end of uh, my tenure there, we were the leaders and our sales teams actually would go to the customers and say, hey, look at this. You know, we are the most effective company at protecting uh, your company names and, and the proprietary information that we're protecting. So it's, it's something that we as security leaders need to embrace, understand, come up with a roadmap, work with partners, and start on the on the journey. And once again, uh, and there is one other thing I want to offer. You know, uh, the other gentleman and I that are on the Zero Trust Working Group, we've come up with a, a PowerPoint deck. It's an 80 slide deck. It doesn't have anything checkpoint in it, but it actually walks you through the phases of your Zero Trust journey. So if you want to have an internal PowerPoint to describe it, to your to your executives and your to your team and say hey we're phase one of phase of five and this is what it's going to take to get to it and it's all based on cloud security alliance and NIST guidance so it's all it's not people making stuff up it's not a you know a consulting group that's whipping up stuff just for the sake of whipping it up it's really a a, a group effort and and really super effective so that's those are my recommendations in long form there, Grant. Terrific. You know, I think the other thing too, I'll mention Pete, and, and uh, I think you'll agree, historically in this business, we've kind of been this bump and run modality, right? I'm gonna give you a great deal by the end of the month or the end of the quarter or oh, the end of the year. It's just always, right? And I think one of the fundamental shifts that has to occur is we have to move away from this uh, bump and run relationship and really foster and establish long lasting partnerships because that's zero trust is not, I'm gonna get it installed by the end of June, right? It's a journey as you mentioned. Uh, and I really think that um, I know our field and you and, and, and others really view the approach has to shift to let's build a relationship. Let's identify your big rocks. Let's go on this journey, not just till the end of uh, the end of the month or quarter, but long term to get you to that comprehensive, collaborative, and a very, very um, uh, what's the third C? I'm missing it. Um, uh, consolidated architecture, there it is. right? There it is. Uh, you know, to, to really, you know, though that's where I think when I talk to people where they want to go, um, but it's not going to happen in those short little relationships, and neither is zero trust. So, you know, Grant, the partnership can't be stressed anymore. Uh, Even and, the roosters are agreeing. Yeah, I'm I'm here in Key West for the week, so there is some roosters that are agreeing with me. You know, and, and, you know, just to plug Checkpoint just a little bit, it's a great company to have a partnership with because we have the widest portfolio of any other provider. So if you look at what we have from endpoint to cloud to email to to data center firewalls to end user yeah. firewalls to and and all and the partnerships that we have for for things, you know, now we have IoT security, we have SD-WAN, we have, you know, all of the uh, the functions we're able to monitor Slack and Teams and DLP and do things that, you know, yeah. w w that are quite unique and, and all on one console and all with one relationship. And with some of the purchasing 
options that we have are huge cost savings. You know, I yep. used to be that best of breed CISO. I used to say, what is the best tool for this? I'm going to get that. Sure. Nobody can argue with me. And now the compelling arguments, uh, because we have less security professionals, you know, what are you going to do? Say, look, you need to learn and get certified on, on 15 different tools. Uh, and, and while the, the checkpoint guys are, you know, they got one certification and one yeah. console and they're able to do everything. So that partnership. But the other thing too, the I mean, thing. Pete, the, the other thing is the maturity of the industry and subsequently the offerings from the industry have improved and therefore the delta between a Dodge and a Chevy, you know, just to mix metaphors. But the Delta in terms of the functionalities is so much slimmer so that we really need to step back and look at different criteria. It's not if it has a cooler UI, right? right. The, the whole point is how does it fit into my ecosystem, my architecture, my right. zero you're mailing, trust strategy? You're, you're, you're waving a flag that I wave as well. You yeah. know, a lot of people, a lot of companies, their purchasing department makes decisions based on price. Yeah. And what what I've really started having a lot of talk about is efficacy. And when you're looking at your zero trust strategy and you're looking at the tools that you're needing, um, look at their efficacy. You know, how do yeah. they compare with their their peers and their colleagues? Because what we're finding is very, very small percentage differences in efficacy have huge different outcomes. You know, I, I'm, I'm on a, a weekly call with a company that has a quarter million inboxes and a 1% change in number of malware deliver, delivered by phishing emails is hundreds and a thousand emails a week. Yep. And now they're reducing their staff that are, that's monitoring this because they're, they're not getting through and they're not having to have, uh, you know, do investigations all the time. Yeah. Uh, that they we're spending up time and, you know, wiping people's computers all the time. And it was a huge waste of time. So, Grant, you have a, you know, that partnership message is key. The efficacy key is key. And then once again, I just want to emphasize the workshop that, uh, that we offer up. You know, talk to us about that because we've got some redacted copies of some of the outcomes that you can request from your from your sales team and it'll show the thoroughness of the report and the strategy uh, that you get so if there's one thing you take away from this get a zero trust workshop from checkpoint <laughs> perfect perfect terrific well pete i always enjoy talking with you man uh it's uh informative it's fun and uh i consider you a good friend as well so uh, thanks so much it was uh it was really great talking with you appreciate it uh and listen to this guy get a hold of your rep and do a workshop i mean it's a no-brainer uh it seems like it's a great starting point and thanks grant i appreciate it and i think this might be the first CISO talk where we ever had uh roosters emphasizing our message so that's right this is the first yeah. time right <laughs> that's right and it was a beautiful thing it's almost like we cued him when to uh, give a shout out so that was awesome thanks pete thanks a lot grant always yep. fun yeah take care